Financial Operations Over the years, college athletics has transformed from an extracurricular activity into a business operation worth billions. More than a thousand institutions are members of the NCAA, with hundreds more being members of the NAIA or the NJCAA. As you have learned, football programs bring in big money, but they also have a large number of expenses. Football and men's basketball are the only two consistently revenue generating sports on large college campuses. Therefore, that revenue goes to fund the other sports on campus. So why do programs continue to operate at a loss? There is no exact answer, but college athletics is not like a regular business. It is a very complex area. There continues to be financial differences between schools and conferences, largely due to television broadcasting deals. Broadcasting contracts for the Power 5 schools range from $200 million to $3.6 plus billion. Contract lengths range from 6 to 25 years, with per school annual payouts running from $15 million to $28 million. These numbers are estimated to increase because negotiating windows exist within all of these contracts. It is not uncommon for schools to look for ways to better advance their programs. One way to do this is by changing conferences, which may increase their chances of getting guaranteed annual payouts from TV deals. In response to this movement, conferences have increased their exit fees to deter schools from leaving. For example, the Atlantic Coast Conference changed their exit fee from $20 million to $50 million. The race to compete for conference and national titles is extremely competitive. Many institutions in smaller conferences feel pressure to compete with financially larger programs. This includes modern facilities, increasing recruiting budgets, buying new equipment, and hiring the best coach as possible. All of these areas can leave institutions in debt. One way debt can be resolved or reduced is by cutting programs. Unfortunately, this can occur at any institution. When the recession of 2008 occurred, institutions of higher education were forced to face the possibility of cuts in public funding. For some D1 and lower division institutions, that rely heavily on allocated revenues from the university, a recession can greatly affect them and their budgets. The organizational structure of intercollegiate athletics is unique to other sports organizations. The big distinction is that college athletic departments are ran within the bureaucratic structure of higher education. Therefore, the mission of the athletics department must align with the overall academic mission. For the most part, this structure is unique to U.S. sports. This can affect public funding, student fees, and the ability of athletic departments to raise capital. The NCAA is a large governing body in intercollegiate athletics. It is controlled by a portion of member university presidents. Therefore, the NCAA has no direct control over an institution's decision regarding conference alignment, media rights, or budgets. The structure of college sport as a nonprofit has effects on the financial operations of the entire industry. College athletics are able to classify as a nonprofit since they fall under the umbrella of the institution. It is not uncommon for expenditures and revenues to increase at a similar rate in a nonprofit organization. This is represented by Bowen's revenue theory of cost. This states that in a nonprofit setting, expenditure increases are a direct result of increased revenue that must be spent by the organization in order to avoid a significant surplus. As an institution of higher learning, there are common goals that are shared by many. These include educational excellence, prestige, and influence. For athletic programs, these goals generally include winning, prestige, and a favorable reputation. In order to achieve these goals, for some institutions there is no limit to what they will spend. That is why institutions will always try to increase revenues and spend all that they raise.
As I mentioned before, men's basketball and football are the two profitable sports on campuses. At D1 schools, they must offer a minimum of 14 sports. That does not mean 14 programs. For example, the University of Georgia sponsors 19 sports that include baseball, men's and women's basketball, men's and women's cross country, women's equestrian, football, men's and women's golf, women's gymnastics, women's soccer, softball, men's and women's swimming and diving, men's and women's tennis, men's and women's track, and women's volleyball. So the revenue generator for football and men's basketball must subsidize the other programs. From an economic standpoint, this is not logical to do for the long run. However, college athletic departments work together in order to make this arrangement work. College athletics fall under the nonprofit status since they are under the institution. One of the main advantages of that is their ability to maintain a tax exempt status because taxes are one of the largest expenses for organizations. Athletic departments operate under Section 501C3 of the IRS, which provides exemption for educational organizations. Organizations that fall under the 501c3 status are exempt from federal income tax and donors who make charitable contributions to these organizations can receive a tax deduction. Therefore, fundraising is a priority for all athletic departments. As you are aware, college athletics work according to a tiered structure. The NCAA is a nonprofit organization whose entity in 2011 was more than $607 million. The organization's revenues for the 2011-2012 year was $871.6 million. 81% of this was generated through television and marketing rights. The majority of the NCAA revenue is distributed back to member institutions. 60 of the D1 programs 17% used to run programs and championships at all levels. The majority of revenue generated by the NCAA is distributed down to the conferences and their members. Conferences have the authority to decide how that revenue is distributed. The distribution of revenue will vary among conferences. Athletic departments do rely on revenue from the NCAA and their conferences but these funds are not their most significant source of revenue. These organizations generally rely on the revenue generated through their individual athletics departments. Revenue is defined as incoming monies or assets of an athletic department. These are just some of them. Ticket sales. Advanced ticket sales are guaranteed income and ensure an audience. Ticket sales to conference or national tournaments are generally excluded since that money goes directly to the conference or the NCAA. For large institutions whose demand is high, it is common practice to have season ticket holders provide a donation for the right to purchase tickets. Number two, NCAA and conference distributions. Three, guarantees. Contractual guarantees between teams in which the home team pays the away team to participate or play against them. Number four, donations. Five, third party support. All agreed upon income from a third party that is not on a W-2 form, such as golf memberships, car allowances, or apparel contracts. Number six, game day, inventory, which could consist of parking, concessions, and merchandise sales. Seven, media rights. Contracted revenue from television or radio broadcasts, TV packages, or program networks. Number eight, royalties, advertising, and sponsorships. Revenue from licensing, advertising, trademarks, and corporate sponsorships. Number nine, sports camps. Camps are clinics hosted by the university and conducted by team coaches and staff members. Number 10, investments. Contributions that are rolled into investments are endowments. Number 11, miscellaneous, such as facility fees. 
Companies can rent out the facility for a fee in order to host events, such as concerts. Number 12, student fees. Enrolled students pay a set of fees each semester that cover a vast number of administrative and overhead costs. A portion of these fees is allocated to intercollegiate athletics. Expenses are outgoing monies or assets that most often take the form of costs to operate the organization. These are just a few. Grant and aid. Athletic scholarships and tuition expenses pay to non-athlete students such as managers. Guarantees. Paying opponents to travel and play at your facility. Number three, salaries and benefits. Salaries represent the largest expense for an athletics department. This is not just coaches, but administrators and support staff. It also includes bonuses and benefits like health insurance. Number four, teen travel. This could be air or grand travel, lodging, and meals for all travelers. Recruiting. Transportation, travel, meals, and lodging incurred during the recruiting process, but while also hosting recruits. Number six, equipment. Team-related equipment or uniforms. Seven, marketing and fundraising. These are costs associated with promoting athletic events and maintaining donor relationships. Number eight, game operations. This could include security, officials, or catering for groups. Number nine, medical. This could include medical insurance premiums for student athletes. 10, membership dues. This could include membership and conference dues. And the last one, facilities and maintenance, operating leases, utilities, equipment repair, or grounds maintenance. There are three types of financial statements commonly used in nonprofit organizations. Statement of financial position, the statement of activities, and the statement of cash flows. The statement of financial position displays the financial condition of the organization at a particular time. It includes three parts, assets, liabilities, and fund balances. The statement of activity shows the organization's revenue and expenses over a period of time. Generally, this is yearly. This can be used to track changes from year to year. The statement of cash flows provides information in regards to the use of cash during a specific period of time. This statement type is generally broken down into operating activities, investing activities, and financing activities. A budget is a document that involves a strategic plan in regards to funds and expenses. The use of a budget can provide the following benefits allows for better control and monitoring of spending, provides a clearer picture of organizational priorities, alerts management to revenue shortfalls, prevents rash financial decisions, provides a working document for strategic planning, offers a precise measurement source for financial performance, and it can motivate employees and staff to meet important goals or objectives. Budgeting is a process that generally consists of data collection, planning, and budget development. Data collection involves gathering internal and external financial information. This information may influence the forecasting of next year's budget. The planning process is creating strategies based on the forecasts learned in the prior steps and the organization's history. Lastly, the budget should be developed for conservative growth based on planning and the data used for forecasting. There are different types of budgets an organization may use. The following are types of operational budgets. A line item budget is a document where individual items are grouped together by department and function. Advantages of a line item budget include simplicity, flexibility, and the ability to measure over time. It is also easy to monitor over time. A program budget is a document in which funds are allocated directly to the program. This type of budget allows an organization to evaluate the efficiency of a given activity. For example, a campaign to sell season tickets 
or attract more youth to home games. Performance budget links funds to measurable results. The information gained is intended to aid in the decision-making process for allocating funds within the organization. For example, an investment in an online recruiting database that leads to additional offers and more recruits. Zero-based budget is a type of budget where all expenses must be justified. It can help an organization spend with strategic goals in mind simply because the budget starts from a zero base. This type of budget is common in high school sports organizations where you can only spend what you bring in. Capital budgets Forms of capital are costly, one-time investments that are not fully consumed within a year, yet provide some sort of financial return or benefit. Examples could be a new air conditioning unit, new scoreboard, or video board. These items are generally high cost, so they don't go into a regular operational budget.